And now we hear from John chapter 8. Let us hear the word of God. Early in the morning, Jesus came again to the temple. All the people came to him, and he sat down and began to teach them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery, and making her stand before all of them, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in the very act of committing adultery. Now in the law, Moses commands us to stone such women. Now, what do you say? They said this to test him so that they might have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, Let anyone among you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. And once again, he bent down and wrote on the ground. When they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the elders. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus straightened up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, sir. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go your way, and from now on, do not sin again. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Now, I never, never considered myself to be a judgmental person until I started working with youth at the Munford Church where I, Shannon and I first started. And uh, they were all the time worried about being judged. I just never had heard anybody so worried about being judged. You're judging me, you're judging me, you're judging me. You couldn't say anything without being called judgmental. And uh, I just didn't know what to do with that. One, one night, Jason, uh, Jason was a, a I think he was about 16, and he was tall. He, he was after one of our girls, okay? We practiced evangelism by dating. That's what we did. So uh, one of our girls, he, he was sweet on her, and he was trying to make an impression on her. They're married and have two or three children now, so it worked. <laughs> but he came into the parking lot. I saw him in his little red car out there. You know that Axe body spray? You know that stuff that that's, you spray that on, and the women just flock to you, to the men? You know, well, there is a limit to how much you can put on, okay? (laughs) When you pass the saturation point, it works in reverse. And so I saw him out there for a long time, refreshing himself in the car, and he opened the door and a cloud just came up. (laughs) He walked through the double doors into our, well, we called it the Family Life Center, just like we do here. It was a gym. He walked into the gym, and uh, he walked by me, and I... I smiled to greet him, and just, it just hit me. Whoa! Jason, what in the world? And he, he kept walking, trying to get back there to Rachel, where she was. And I, I grabbed his arm. I said, get over here. Come here. And I said, Jason, you got too much of that stuff on. You, that's, it's bad. And he said, you're judging me. Don't judge me. Don't judge me. And I said, brother, I'm trying to help you. I'm just telling the truth. You stink. <laughs> you just stink so he it didn't work he went on back there anyway but I felt like I was just stating the fact and trying to help you know I'm just trying to help this boy and uh, I realized sometimes sometimes just stating the fact and trying to help gets us in a heap of trouble doesn't it even when it's well intentioned but now other times well there's nothing judgmental about stating the fact and trying to help But other times, we do make judgment and condemnation our our chief language, don't we? Why do we do that? Why in the world would we who have received grace upon grace, why would we do that? I don't know. Maybe uh, Maybe we need to feel better than somebody else. 
Maybe, uh, maybe we're just pointing out somebody else's flaw so they don't see ours first, right? And that works pretty good if you hadn't tried it. I wouldn't recommend it, but it does work. So I don't know about you. I, I find myself so often judging people and condemning people when they're not, when they're not even present to defend themselves, you know? I'll say something to a friend or to my wife or to someone that I work with. I'll say some harsh word of judgment about somebody that's not even present. And, uh, you know, you try to think, well, I didn't say it to them, so it's not judgmental. Well, it's still, it's still judgment, even when they are not there, isn't it? We, uh, we followers of Jesus, we ought to do better. We ought to do better. I ought to do better. And a lot of times we do, don't we? A lot of times we get it right, but sometimes we don't. We even, uh, we even judge each other, you know. We preachers are the worst, worst of all. Now, what will happen after annual conference in a few weeks? We will get the journal, and we'll start to look. Jerry can tell, back me up on this, and Ron too, and other Ron. We, this is what we do. We look through the journal, and we say, whose salary went up? And whose attendance went down? And we make all kind of judgments on that and uh, sometimes get downright nasty about it. But you know, we do it here in the church too. We, we uh, judge each other. I don't like how they worship. I just don't like it. I can't stand it. Their music is it's just too highfalutin or it's too lowfalutin, whatever that is. I don't even know what that is. What we're saying, though, is <laughs> we, it's just not worship unless I like it. And that's not true. That can't be true. I was once with my, with my grandmother back at home several years ago, and I was sitting with her in the congregation, and we were singing a hymn, and she leaned over to me and said, Look over there at that woman. Look over there at that woman. Just look at her. I looked over at her, and she had her hands up like this. She had her eyes closed. She was singing, praising God, and Nana said, she lifts up both hands while she's singing every Sunday, and she doesn't even look at the hymnal. She's like some wild Pentecostal. <laughs> and I thought, Nana, you hadn't seen a wild Pentecostal if, if you think that's bad. <laughs> I said, Nana... Nana, don't, don't you think maybe that's just how she worships? Maybe, maybe that's just what, what helps her connect with God? No, that's not it. She's just showing out, bless her heart. She's just showing out. <laughs> it's bad enough that we do that in the church. But somehow we've gotten quite the reputation among non-church people too. Did you know the, the number one reason people who don't come to church say they don't come to church is because, it used to be because we were hypocrites, okay? I think we finally got the word out, yes, we are. We've got room for one more. Come on, we finally got that out. <laughs> so that, that moved to number two, and now number one is we are too, what's the word? Too judgmental. We're too judgmental. And now we could uh, parse that statement a little bit. You know, it, it's, it's one thing to try to live a holy life, and it's another thing to be judgmental. But there is a lot of truth to the impressions that they have. So I wonder, where did we, where did we learn how to vilify people who think differently from us, who act differently from us? Who gave us permission to condemn folks? Who, did we get, did you see that somewhere? Do we have permission to condemn folks and to pass judgment on folks? I don't know where we got that. Maybe, maybe we learned it from these Pharisees that we heard from today. Maybe we learned it from them whose, whose interpretation of the law allowed them the spiritual honor of stoning to death this adulterous floozy. That's all they were concerned about. We're going to get to stone this woman to death. Maybe that's where we learned how to point our fingers at each other. Where we learned how to, how to throw words full of hate and judgment at those who need us to love them more than anything else. Not condemn, not condemn them. 
poor Jesus. You know, he just he shows up at the temple to teach his Bible study. He's sitting on the steps of the temple trying to teach his Bible study and uh, minding his own business. And then they come bringing this woman. They sling her down at his feet, interrupting his class. Can you see that woman? Can you see her? Can you see that woman just lying in the dirt, fearing for her life? She was ripped out of the bed of some man. She really was taken from her sexual indiscretion to prove a theological point. She really was. She was caught in the very act. There could be no more humiliating thing that could happen to anybody on the face of the planet. And now, where is this man? You know, what's that? It takes two to tango. Is that? Yeah. Where is the man? If they're so concerned about the law, they ought to know that according to the letter of the law, this man is supposed to be stripped naked and stoned to death right beside her. Where is he? Did he get away? You know, I mean, you would think they were pretty close together when they got the woman. They could have got the man too. (laughs) Is that him? Can you see? Is that him running off in the distance with his bear behind shining in the moonlight? (laughs) Look, if y'all run, you can catch him. He's right over there. No, no, don't worry about him. Don't worry about, we're not worried about him. It's okay. We're just trying to prove a point here. That's all we're trying to do. No sense in killing two birds with one stone. And one will do. One will be just fine. So they stand her up in front of Jesus. And they say, this woman was caught in the very act of adultery. The law of Moses says we should stone her. What do you say? The law says we should stone her. What do you say? Say that with me. The law says we should stone her. What do you say? They're trying to trick him, you know. They're always trying to trick Jesus. If he says, if he says, go ahead, stone her today, then they can bring him up on religious charges of blasphemy and of ignoring the law of Moses. He's caught. He cannot get out of this. He has to provide some kind of answer. So Jesus knelt down and wrote in the dirt. Sometimes it's good to play in the dirt, isn't it? I wonder what he wrote. I wonder, did he list all the sins of those gathered in the crowd? (laughs) I wonder, did he draw a picture on the ground of the Ten Commandments? You know, the two tablets like in the Charlton Heston movie. I wonder if he drew that out and if he he underlined the Seventh Commandment and marked out the Sixth. I wonder if that's what he did. Maybe he did that. Or did did he list the names of all those men in that crowd who had been with that woman, starting with the oldest? Or did he just write... I am so sorry. This is not at all what God had in mind. The law says, the law says we should stone her to death. What do you say? We get asked that a lot, don't we? Maybe not quite so directly, but we get asked it all the time. Friends, neighbors, co-workers, family members, other Christians... Political parties trying to make points with the religious people from both sides. When did we become a tool of the empire to be co-opted by those in power? When did that happen? When did we let that happen? People are always lining up folks in front of us. Groups of people, types of folks. Their, Their sins are listed. Their brokenness is put on display for all the world to see. And they are put in categories. And groups, so we can't see them as individuals. And the world wants us to agree. They stand these folks up in front of of us. And they say, these are broken, sinful people. They are of no value. They are too sorry. They're too sorry to count for anything good. They are wasting oxygen and taking up space. All that's left, church, is for you to pass your final word of judgment on these folks, and we can put them out 
and move on with the rest of our lives. That's what the world says to the church. The law says, stone them to death. But what do you say? But what do you say? Too often, I'm afraid, the church in obedience to the world, the church in obedience to the world says, yes, sir, yes, sir, yes, sir. We'll bring the rocks and the bumper stickers. You just line them up in front of us. But not Jesus. That's not what Jesus says. Jesus stands up from writing in the dirt and he says those incredible words. Let he who is without sin cast the first stone. These accusers, these judges, they went away from the oldest to the youngest, leaving only Jesus and this woman. I just imagine he looked her right in the eyes. And he said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir. No one, sir. In talking to this woman, Jesus makes himself unclean. Did you know that? Jesus makes himself unclean so that this woman can hear a word of forgiveness and be offered the promise of a new and better way of life. Jesus makes himself unclean for that. Then he speaks, he speaks what should be the heart of God's church. I hope and pray that it's your heart and mine too. He says, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. He marries together this word of lavish forgiveness with this invitation to, to a way of life that is so much better than anything she has ever known before. He looks at her and he sees a person who is worthy of God's love and grace just like he is and just like you are, just like I am. I have heard uh, this week so, so many of your stories of forgiveness and redemption. A lot of you responded after that little video, uh, maybe just because I suggested we would act this out. But anyway, we've, we had a lot of stories, stories of the power of love over judgment of the, the work of grace so much better than the hammer of condemnation, of the endless patience of God poured into our lives as we, as we slip and stumble along the narrow way that leads to life. The gentle words of a friend helping us to stay on the right road and the, the witness of a sister in Christ who has, who has walked this journey before and the promise of God's forgiveness toward us no matter what. And then I heard from my friend, my sister. She said, she said, I was taught all my life, all my life to hate sin more than I loved people. I still hate sin, but I am learning. I am learning, finally, how to love people even more than I hate sin. What does it mean for the church to be the one place in the world where we can be received just as we are and offered this lavish forgiveness along with an invitation into a way of life that is so much better than anything we could ever have imagined for ourselves. I think this crowd of stone throwers that we see today, this crowd of stone throwers has its heart changed. I think Jesus 
teaches them something about receiving folks with open arms and with love that knows no end and no beginning. I think Jesus shows us a picture of God who always, always, always receives us right where we are and who loves us too much to leave us there. I think of this I think of this old preacher who told me a long time ago. He said, son, always remember. (laughs) I've never yet, I've never yet seen somebody hate the sin out of somebody else. But I have sure had a whole lot of people love the hell out of me. (laughs) That's the way of Jesus. And that's our way too. Thanks be to God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, may the people of God say, Amen.